Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gents, I want y'all to hold on a second. Just, just give me a second. Hold on. I know y'all will be able to hear it. See that right there? He's live. Now, what we can't do is we can't show y'all the live because that junk is, you know, they like to say copy my written. We're going to show y'all this document right here. And we're going to show y'all what this document is designed to do. You can amend it, create it, rearrange it, do whatever you want to with it. But y'all, I'm going to turn down Phil in my background. Come on, Phil, hurry up now. Hurry up now. All right, Phil going to be in our background because he's going to be talking about what's in the air tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, the Superior Court of blah, 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 state at blah, 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 county. Henry, your first name, in his or her natural capacity. Then the name of the corporation at all. Then the name of the state. Okay. Now, this is a motion to dismiss with prejudice. Proper capacities. See, I, I know this word is wrong, and I knew that when I did it, and it didn't correct it the first time. It has long been held by the courts throughout the nation that it is within the state's privy to require corporations' names to be in all capital letters, to differentiate or to distinguish it from a natural person. These are the cases. Okay? No, no, no. That, that, that's not... No, these are the rest of the cases. Okay? Oh, oh, there they go. That's where it ends. Okay? These cases establish that the principle that the use of all cats' names... In the name of the corporation is a customary means of distinguishing corporations from natural person. This convention is used in order to avoid confusion. And I have a right to not be confused and to make it clear that the entity in question is a corporation and not a natural person. So take the, my name out of all capital letters, mother. <clears throat> Sorry. So when you put the name of the state in all capital letters, hey, corporation. Thank you. EIN number. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want y'all to pay attention. This practice is employed by the state as well as the court through the court style manual. And I object to such a practice when referencing my natural person. The state may adopt whatever methods it was to distinguish blah, 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 blah. And that's number two. So we'll go to the next paragraph right here. I possess an alien. The long arm statute. This is for a person who is from a different state. I am cognizant of the fact that I am a natural person as defined in law. And as a natural person, I do not believe the court has the capacity in its current setting as and as evidenced by the record to compel any natural person to participate in these proceedings over their objection to the jurisdiction of the court. The use of the all capital lettering names is a convention generally followed by in business world to distinguish corporations from natural persons. You place the name of my sole proprietorship in the caption of this case. I did not engage in a verbal contract with the opposing party via such an understanding. Who told you y'all could bring my private corporation into this? I don't have a contract with you through my private corporation, my, my sole proprietorship. You're infringing upon my right to contract, my right to property, my rights or property, my reputation by placing the name of my corporation in the caption of this matter when I engaged in an agreement with the opposing party in my natural capacity. This is regarding a contractual dispute. I do not care whether or not you think it relevant. The law says, and the court's opinions say, that I have the right to raise such an objection, and the court must indicate such in the record that I stand before the court in my natural capacity in submitting to your stupid mutton jurisdiction. So this is what I wrote, and I was serious when I wrote it. I don't work for railroad company, but I have taken the train before. And it appears you are trying to take me for such a ride, and I object. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, 
I'm just saying the person's being railroaded. Okay, that's all. I remember Phil Collins has said he's not doing any more concerts. And I don't blame him. You can get to the point where you can sing a song just too much and too many times, okay? You'll say it doesn't matter if the name is in all caps or lowercase caps or an upper lowercase type font. Thank you for documenting that it doesn't matter to you. So, if that is the case, then it won't matter if you correct the caption and place my name in upper lowercase lettering with the first initial and or letters being capitalized in every letter thereafter being lowercase font for each assigned and or associated name associated with my person in its natural capacity. Thank you for your medical accommodation. It is greatly appreciated as it will help in my communicating with the court. The Americans with Disabilities Act highlights the fact that communication is a disability and you have a right to communicate with the court effectively and the court must communicate with you effectively so that you may understand. And remember, we just talked about confusion and we don't want no confusion. I can't stand confusion, okay? I asked the court which language is supposed to be was it, not wasn't. Speaking and it, it did not respond. I am now needing the court to respond It's supposed to be which language? Wake up as to which language it Stop listening The language of Black's Law Dictionary, i.e. legal terminology, or is it using English, the English dictionary, the language of the people? English is known as the language of the people, people. It is important that I get an answer to this question, as it is an inconvenience for my person not to know the language of the, the language the court is relying upon, and to challenge the fact that the statute for which I am being charged is written in legalese, a foreign language with respects to the English language. Ladies and gentlemen, we go on to explain legalese, legal terminology, what it is and what it ain't. Okay? Then it says, elements of a crime. This person is being accused of passing a fictitious instrument. Technically, no, they're not. They're accused of breaching a contract. If the prosecution met its their burden of probable cause in this matter. This is not of the prosecution, it's the if. Careless whispers, George Michaels, I ain't heard you in a long time. Thank you. Probable cause hearing means that they have to produce evidence documenting the elements of a crime. Let's see if an actual documentation of evidence of a crime, if there's an actual documentation of evidence of a crime, so that we can establish the facts that this case, the facts of this case, so that I can understand the nature of these proceedings. Ladies and gentlemen, we talk about the basic elements of a crime. This person is being accused, and the fact that it says California, I'm going to put, I'm going to highlight California. Okay. Uh, they're being accused of stealing a vehicle. When there is no contract and the party agreed, the person could take the vehicle. Okay. All there needs to be is consent. And it's a civil matter. It's not a criminal matter. The state decided to take it. So this person says that they are, they don't live in California. They live in District of Washington, D.C. And they have a right to cross-examine any witness against them. Let me explain something to you guys. I'm George, I'm sorry to do this to you guys. Excuse me one second while I, I pause George because you guys know how much I love George. George, George is my, you know, this man could sing. Okay, that man could sing. George Michaels, ladies and gentlemen, him with wham and careless whispers. Um, ladies and gentlemen, at 4.45 a.m. yesterday, I had a young man call me. Young man said, hey, I want to be back at SACOM. 
I want to work for SACOM and I want to be a CEO, a CFO, and a CEO or something like that. You want to be all them C's. We don't have any crypts working for uh, SACOM. Apologize. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, 4.45 in the morning, I sent them a voicemail. I ain't answered no phone from, especially from nobody that I haven't given permission to call me at that time of the morning. So I listened to the voicemail and I heard it and I went back to sleep. But no, I couldn't go back to sleep. Because he called back 15 minutes later. And, ladies and gentlemen, he had called the first time and said, I can consider that his application for employment. That he wanted to come back to Stockholm. We have a policy, if you leave Stockholm or if we terminate you, you have to wait a year before you can reapply. So he's waited more than a year. And he reapplied. Over the phone, nonetheless. He says, I can consider that his application. We have policies, ladies and gentlemen, and that ain't it. He knows it. So, what did he do? I want y'all to pay attention because it, it can't be no other way. I want y'all to pay attention because it can't be no other way. Ladies and gentlemen, he called me back. And he said that he was suing SATCOM for discrimination. That he felt SATCOM had discriminated against him. I'm like, okay, how did SACOM discriminate against you? You quit voluntarily because you said you had too many things going on. There was so much going on in your life. Okay, fine. So I wrote the person back. I said, first of all, I don't know where you think you're getting me, but nobody gave you permission to be calling me at no 445 in the morning, and you know I live on the West Coast. I said, in a second, you better go back and take a look at the arbitration agreement. It's designed for situations just like this. You want to bring accusations? Well, go to arbitration. Other than that, I can't help you. And I said, third, you voluntarily quit. You said you had all these problems going on. And then I said, fourth, because you threatened the organization, you will not be permitted to be a part of the organization your offer is hereby rejected. Then he came back and said he sent, pay attention to the organization, a writ of execution, and that we were bound by the writ of execution. So I sent him a final communication. I said, let me go ahead and make sure you understand. This is my way of, uh, check please, check, 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 check please. This was my way of making sure this person understood who, the, <coughs> uh, who they were uh, talking to. So I told the person, I said, first of all, let me make sure you understand. A writ of execution? It appears that you thought that you had done something that would do something. I said, go back and take a look at the arbitration agreement. It's perpetual and it's irrevocable. You can't cross that veil. You can't cut the veil. You can't destroy the veil of the arbitration agreement. It is etched in stone, so to speak. I said, in second, you are hereby given a cease and desist order. You're not allowed to communicate my person again, nor are you allowed to communicate with anyone in the organization respecting this matter. CEO type thing. Go back, follow the arbitration agreement, comply with that and the arbitrator will communicate with you once you put your ducks in a row I said that's the end of this conversation and I discontinued the communication and I blocked him from dialing my number again what you all don't know because I left this part out is last week the individual called me and they called me from jail and they told me they had a situation and they needed my help I said, okay, tell me the situation. They said they were being charged with third degree assault. The, it was on a recorded line at the prison, so it wasn't a private conversation because we agreed and consented that the call was not private. So I can tell y'all this. Thank you, prison, for 
or the jail, thank you for giving me this opportunity of telling this to the public because other than that, it would be a private conversation, attorney-client privilege, and I wouldn't be able to say anything. But he consented to me being able to tell you. He said they had on video him assaulting someone else, and they showed him the video, but the video doesn't have audio. I said, well, then. He says, and he goes to court on Monday. I said, okay. I said, what you're going to do is you're going to go to court on Monday, and you're going to tell him you want to see the video, and you want to cross-examine the video. So you're going to call the video as a witness. And I said, and you're going to cross-examine the video to see if what they're saying happened actually happened. And if it is aware of any other facts surrounding this matter, uh, so that you can be aware of exactly what information is out there. And you might actually do discovery on the video. And he told me, really? I said, yes, you have a right to cross-examine any witness against you. And if they told you they're going to use the video as a witness against you, then that's where they up. So you tell them that you have the right to cross-examine any witness against you. Ladies and gentlemen, the attorney came to meet him the day next after that. And the attorney that's representing him in court said to him that, no, 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 you, you can't do that. They won't let you do that and blah, blah, blah. So he calls me after he speaks to the attorney, collect, mind you. And the very fact that he calls me collect and that call from where he was, the facility, $6 per call. Six per call. We didn't even stay on 15 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, he tells me that the attorney, he told it to the attorney, and the attorney said no, he couldn't do that. And I said, I didn't ask you whether or not the attorney agrees. I said, the attorney works for the court. He doesn't work for you. I said, he's an officer of the court. So I don't care what the attorney says, you are going to tell them in court on Monday, I have a right to cross-examine a witness, I want to call the video camera into court. I said, you will say it as loud as you can if you have to. <sighs> he called me two days ago, pay attention, no, yesterday, sorry, Friday. He called me yesterday, 4 o'clock in the morning, from a cell phone. He was no longer in jail. Now, hold on. Do you think that mother, <coughs> that person uh, bothered to thank me? See, here's the premise, ladies and gentlemen. You have the absolute right to compulsory testimony of witnesses being used against you. Any witness, any evidence being used against you, you have the right to cross-examine that evidence. If they're using it as a witness, then you have a right to cross-examine that witness through compulsory testimony. It has to speak back. If you're not allowed to ask it questions, now people say these cameras, when you're driving down the street and you get those little photo camera tickets, ladies and gentlemen, the person who's sitting in a, in a desk in some room looking at a video monitor, he can't testify. He doesn't have first-hand knowledge. He's watching it through a monitor, the same as the jury would be watching it through a monitor. He has no first-hand knowledge. He cannot testify in court. He is not a witness to the actual facts. The camera is the witness. The camera took the photo. He is not holding the camera. So he does not get to testify as to first-hand knowledge. He wasn't present. I apologize that many people don't know these things. I told you guys, I received a ticket where they said that I had run a red light. Now, I didn't ask for the camera. I just told them straight up, I don't run red lights. I do not run red lights. I said, my best friend died because some idiot ran through a red light. I don't run red lights. They came back. They took a better look at the photo that they took and it turns out I was turning left on a green arrow and it had just turned yellow while I'm in the middle of the intersection so they had to dismiss that ticket 
But ladies and gentlemen, since then, I decided, wait a minute, I'm going to do some more research on these little stupid little cameras. How are they going to use a camera to call somebody in court? Ladies and gentlemen, anybody want to use a camera as a witness? Don't let them. There's no law saying that they didn't anticipate that with the Constitution. Constitution says compulsory. So unless the Constitution is amended to incorporate cameras and include technician, then a technician cannot testify because he does not have first-hand knowledge. His knowledge is third-hand at best. So that's why the individual is no longer in there. Now, they may have told him something else, and of course they're going to tell him something else because they cannot let him know the genius and what was being said. Again, you think he bothered to thank me. So here we are here. Ladies and gentlemen, the edits I'm doing in this, I did this. It took me two hours to put this 11-page document together. Two hours. Because I was doing this during a consult. I don't do documents for people. But this particular person, yeah, because of his situation, I decided to do this document. Now, there is already evidence on the record via testimony and a statement that there was an agreement between the parties. And they do have evidence that there's agreement between the parties. Well, if there's an agreement between the parties, a written agreement and a verbal agreement are binding. Citations that agree with the contention that an application is the nexus that operates as a contractual agreement. In this situation, there was no written agreement. Normally, in a normal course of business, there is a written agreement. But in this particular instant, there was no agreement written. The agreement was verbal. They have video. Hold on now. <laughs> they have video that they're going to use against him. So I told him he's going to use the very same argument. The video they have against him, there's no audio. Well, then you can't use that as evidence. They're using it to show that money changed hands. That means that there was an agreement. But that's all it means. It doesn't mean anything else. But you can't use it as evidence against him. That's the point. Then we talk about the elements of a crime. Ladies and gentlemen, we asked some questions. And the questions we, we ask, wait, hold on. The following support is supported by judicial knowledge. That the court can't take anybody's property. What did they take from him? Ladies and gentlemen, not only did they take his right to plea, your rights are your property, ladies and gentlemen. That's why they're yours. They are saying your rights, not somebody else's. Your rights are your property. So the court decided that because of COVID, if they were going to do an arraignment, they could sit up there and enter a plea on a party's behalf even though they weren't there. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no law that gives them that right to do that. Some judge, some presiding judge made that decision. Sorry, the presiding judge does not have that authority. There is no law that gives the presiding judge the right to do such a thing. So he's challenging that. Ladies and gentlemen, you guys are going to have to go through this. Uh, now, it involved a U-Haul truck. Okay, here's the problem. U-Haul said, we're not prosecuting. We're, 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 we're not uh, following no complaint against you. So what's the state doing? Exactly. The act of entering a plea or verdict thereto and therein does not thereby and therein admit to the genius of the record, charging document, instrument, indictment, and does not admit the validity of the statute law cited therein and does not thereby form the issue of trial which would exist even if the plea and without which there is anything before the court or jury for trial which states that case right there the very act of pleading to an indictment admits the genius of the record the plea forms the basis of give me one second the averment is that comma The averment
stop listening. Basically, all it's saying is that when you enter a plea, you give the court something for which to have jurisdiction. If you don't enter a plea, the court has no jurisdiction. The right to enter a plea is a property right. It's not the right of the court to enter a plea, it's the right of the defendant to enter a plea. This court has made a profit and or gain, either through the court's registry or otherwise, off of my property, which is a violation of the Takings Clause. For I have not been compensated for my time and expenses associated thereto. You took my right. It's my right to plea. How dare you sit up there and take my right from me and not compensate me for taking my right because the court could only take the right for public use. So it's a violation of the takings clause. He doesn't have to prove that they violated the takings clause. He just has to say they violated the takings clause. The court is not permitted to take another person's property without a hearing. It appears that the court issued an emergency order to deprive people of the right to a hearing involving a substantial property interest, contrary to the Supreme Court precedent and well-established principles. Now, these are cases that say that at a minimum, if any substantial due process right is at stake, an individual is required to have a hearing. See, the rights that I possess are supposed to be are inalienable. Let's get that in here. A-R-E secure they predate the constitution of either the united states of america or the states of the union these rights are fundamental private rights of every person due process clause of the 14th amendment requires that every citizen be given notice and an opportunity to be heard before a government official seizes his or her property okay now Sorry, that's me yawning. The statement, I have inalienable rights. My rights are my possession. They belong to me. They are my property is a contention. Stop listening. Sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. It sometimes acts a fool. As a contention that has been made by many people throughout history, the idea that rights are inalienable or cannot be taken away is a fundamental principle of many legal systems. In the United States, the right to property is explicitly protected by the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution. The Fifth Amendment protects states that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. This means that the government cannot take away the property without the following fair procedures, or but without following fair procedures or their procedures. The contention that the rights are inalienable is important because it protects individuals from government's power. It ensures that the government can't not take away a person's right without good reason. That's barred talking, ladies and gentlemen. You know it. The minimum due process rights required before an individual may be deprived of property, he be given notice and an opportunity for a hearing. You can't take away anybody's property that is a substantial property right without a hearing. Sorry, they don't have the right to do that. Acting in clear absence of all jurisdiction. So I'm going to put this document up here. Miss Persian of Felony. This person lives more than 80 miles away. He lives thousands of miles away. Do you know the court ordered him to show up at a hearing? Ordered him to show up at a hearing at his expense. So he's going 1099 to court. No, 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 no. Because once the court orders you to do something, you now work for the court. They're not saying that you're being placed in servitude. So if you're not being placed in servitude, that means you become an employee. The court has just compelled you into service. So... You run a 1099 to court. As stated above, so say it a more. I created that right there. This court 
has deprived me of my right, my right to property, my right to due process, my due process right, qualities are my possessions. Uh uh. It's not supposed to be qualities are my possession. Oh, okay. Wake up. My rights are. Stop listening. My property. And it has done so and has made substantial gains as evidenced by the financial records of this particular institution and has failed to compensate as a result of the seizure of my property without notice and without due process of law. The takings clause prohibits such conduct and I bring forth such a claim as violation of the taking clause. By taking my property from me, including my right to enter a plea, if I should so choose directly, there is no constitutional provision that allows the court to abridge my person of the right to petition the court, even if the petition is in the form of a plea. That was my choice. Remember, you petition the court, I plead guilty, not guilty, or no contest. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, I was pausing there for a second. All right. This court had no right to assign counsel to my person without my authorization and or my consent, which I did not give. See, you have the right to an attorney, but they must ask you if you want an attorney. They can't just assign an attorney to you because they feel like it. Thus, seizing for my, it's supposed to be from, let's do that, my person, the right to counsel of choice, it matters not if it is a practice or not. What matters is that it was my right, and I object to the, uh, I object to it in this court. Uh, it's supposed to be I object to it, and this court, I objected to it, and this court ignored me. I am, I am legend. Again, acting in clear absence of all jurisdiction. We do no conclusions because we're not concluding nothing. We're summarizing what we just wrote. There must be present the elements of a crime. That means that theft would have to have been without the owner's consent. The owner and or sublet owner, because it wasn't U-Haul, it was uh, one of their agents, has documented that there was an agreement. Consent, thus an element of a crime, is eliminated as a result of an affidavit placed on the record. They've already said he had consent. Okay? There you go. So, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to offer you guys the opportunity of taking this document and creating your own, adding what you need to add, and having your own format. Okay? This thing took two hours to put together. The gentleman said, Did you, are you reading from a script or did you just put that together? I said, No, I just put that together. And this is right here. This is supposed to be mailing. So I'm glad I saw this. Okay, we do the certification and acknowledgement at the same time. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, let me make sure you understand something. This thing says under penalty. Okay? So help me God under penalty if held otherwise. Not under penalty of perjury. It's under penalty of divine retribution. That's why it's so help me God, not so help me the court. Just keep that in mind when you're doing things like this. Hey, I got to go. I hope this finds you in a good state and... Or in a bad state. Or in one of the states of the union, okay? Have a good day, everyone. Got to go, got to go, got to go. I'm going to go back and listen to George Michaels. See y'all later. That's me yawning again. George, take us on out of here. That's just showing these people how tired I is. Gotta go, ladies and gentlemen.